coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. You can be seated. Read what I just look up to heaven and say, God, shift my worship. I want to tag today's message true worship and this is this is teaching pure teaching on today uh true worship and let me, let me give you the big idea up front for, for, for those of you who are writers and, and you'll see that each week the whole purpose is to shift the way that we view uh, worship the same way it was when we shifted the way that we view giving it's the same concept today so here's the big idea for this uh second ins installment per se Shift from seeing worship as a weekend experience to seeing worship as a daily lifestyle. So that, that's our goal this series. That's our, that's our target. That's our mark. That's the tangible uh, 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 place that we're trying to get to. At the end of this series, we want to shift from seeing worship as a weekend experience to sing worship as a daily lifestyle. Okay, so let's, let's, before we get too far into it, let's look up the word, let's look at these definitions of the word worship. We tend to typically use the, the English word, the English definition for worship, and that is a verb, which we know that worship is. Worship is something that's actually done, right? So the English definition is, is worship involves one person's recognition of another person's superior state, status, or honor. Don't write that one down. I'll give you what I want you to write down. But the definition from the English dictionary is that worship involves a person's recognition of another person's sub, sub, uh, superior status or honor. But that's not how the Bible describes true worship. True worship is not just looking at God as someone who is superior than you. Because if that was the only definition, then guess what? Then we would worship anybody who was superior than us in any area of our life, right? LeBron James is better at basketball than most of us in here. Most of us. Most of us. Then you got a few like me and Bunny. You know, we can, we'll find out one day, okay? But, but he would be superior, but that doesn't mean because we recognize his superiority in that specific area does not mean we necessarily worship him. So just because you recognize that God is a higher being, that God is stronger than you, that God is bigger than you, that God is wiser than you, it does not necessarily mean that you worship him. So at the end of this message, you'll discover if you're truly a worshiper of God, you'll discover if you are a true worshiper. Okay, let's look at the Bible uh, definition of the word worship. In this particular text, the Greek word for worship is proskunio, and it means to kiss the ground when prostrated before a superior. As you can see, that's a little bit different, right, than recognizing someone who's just a little superior than you. That, that's a little bit different because how many of you would actually get down on the ground, lay prostrate, and kiss the ground in reverence of somebody like LeBron James? I hope none of you, right? I mean, how, how many of you would actually lay down? Some of you might want to raise your hand on this one. If you saw Beyonce front row in concert going in, how many of you would actually, now there are some people that would, that, that worship her. We don't have nobody part of the Beehive in here, right? The Beehive. Okay, I don't want you smashing my tire in after church, okay? <laughs> but what many, most would not lay down, prostrate on the ground, face to the ground, kissing in reverence to her. So it just right there, you see the difference in the way America, the, the dictionary English has defined worship and the way God sees worship, okay? Here's my definition that we'll use throughout this series. I, I, I had a real fancy Casey, and God was just like, it's really not all that fancy. Here's my definition that we'll use throughout the series. Worship, the response of a born-again believer to the work of an awesome God. Simple, that's it. That's what a worship is. That's my definition. Now, I've seen a lot of commentary this week for theologians who had this big, deep, and long stuff you couldn't even memorize, okay? Word that I had to look up in the dictionary. But my definition of worship that I'll use in this series, simple so that we can all understand it, it's the response of a born-again believer to the work of an awesome God, right? So this lets us know that worship is so much broader 
this 30 minute portion of our service. Right? That's what we typically think, Marvin, when we think of worship. We think about that part when Dana and April and Candy and Kiara and Kayla and all the different people, Faith and Faith. We think that when we hear the word worship, that's what we typically limit it to. That small portion of, 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 of a group of people getting on the stage and leading us in song. While that's part of it, what I want us to shift to see is that worship is so much bigger than just songs. Worship is so much bigger. It's a lifestyle. It's something that we do every day. I don't know about you, but I believe according to the definition I created that every day we can somehow respond to how awesome God is. Yes. Yes. We can respond to how awesome he is by the way that we live. Yes. We can respond to how awesome he is by the way that we talk. We can respond to how awesome he is by the way that we think. We can respond to how awesome he is by the places that we go, by the music that we listen to, by what we want. All of these things can be responses to how awesome we think God really is. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Okay, I got to work. Okay. Let's to see the end result as we want it to shift. The first thing we have to do, Nisha, is to see the error in our current thinking of worship, right? Because the only way that I'm going to shift from A to point A to point B is if I feel like I really need to be at point B, right? But if I don't think, uh, uh, Rashad, that anything's wrong with point A, where I am, then I have no reason to shift. So first, I want to give you a couple things that tells us what worship is not, okay? Write in if you're some writers. Number one, worship is not about me. This is the biggest piece of information that we need to shift from seeing worship as a Sunday experience and shifting to seeing it something that should be part of our daily life now. Repeat that after me. Worship, worship. is not, not about not me. About if truth be told, most of us in here came this morning with a desire to worship so that we could get something out of it. Agree? Raise your hand if the, 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 the biggest part of you wanted to be at worship this morning was so that you could get something out of it. Oh my God, three people. If I judge worship 
then you need to shift. Am I saying anything's wrong with that? No. When we get toward the end of the series, we'll talk about the benefits of being in the presence of God with worship, but you got to realize that should not be our sole purpose for worshiping. Why? Because that's not what it was in the Bible day. Somehow, we shifted away from what worship really was. Okay? So what's my first one? Worship is not about me. We think whether we say it out loud, we think by our actions that worship was created for me when worship was really created for God. Come on. <laughs> Come on. That's what it was about. Yes. God never sat down and said, let's create something that blesses the people and let's call it worship. Right. that makes the people feel good and jolly on the inside and makes them feel awesome and makes them feel all of these different jittery things that they love to feel on Sunday morning. Let, let's create something like that. Uh, the, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, they, they didn't have a meeting one day at a conference table and said, let's create something that makes Adam and Eve feel good. Let, let's create something that makes Cain and Abel and Gretchen. Let, let, let's create something. What should we call it? Let, Father, Then you go on the west side of heaven. No, 
church book. Okay? <laughs> it's like, that's not. That, when did y'all define that? Wow. I was like, it's not a genre. God help us. At all. But that's what we think. It's like, it's worship music time. Well, no, we can't say that because that's not worship. Mm. Says who? Says America? <laughs> says the 21st century worship theologians? Who said that? Right. So worship is not what? We're breaking some errors, some thought process. We can't shift without realizing what we need to shift from. So worship is not what? Yeah. Worship is not about me. So we throwing away coming in here on Sunday morning trying to get something. Nothing wrong with getting something out of it, but that's not going to be our purpose from now on. Okay? The second one is what? Worship is what? It's not a genre of music. It's a lifestyle. Singing is part of the lifestyle, but that's not the whole pie. Yeah. That's just a piece of the sweet potato pie. Okay? It's none of the pumpkin. If you eat pumpkin, get out of here. Like, <laughs> sweet potato pie on Thanksgiving, okay? <laughs> so, so, what's the last one on, on, on some areas that we could have came over with a lot of them, but I think three. Worship is not a simple music. Let's bust that. Mm -hmm. Let's bust that. Worship is not a tempo of music. In, in, in the church, that's what we think, right? We think it's all about what separates praise and worship is what? Praise is tempo. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we that's what we created in America. Right. It's all about tempo. It don't even matter what the words is. I love you, Jesus. Woo! I worship and adore. What is that? Praise or worship? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That's praise. <laughs> and now we slow it down. Decisions, 
But as on a whole, on a bigger scale, we're just going to make something out of 10 decisions in a day, did 9 out of 10, were they decided by you or God in the Bible? Yeah. If the majority of the decisions that you make on a daily basis is not rooted in the Bible or what God specifically tells you about that situation, then guess who controls your worship? Talk, talk, church! Who controls your worship if the majority of the decisions that you make on a daily basis come from you and not the Bible of God? Nobody want to say it? You. you. So if you control your action, who has your worship? Yeah. Woo! We got some idol worshipers in the building. Why? Because if you worship anybody but God, guess what? You have created an idol. Somebody's like, yes, I need to shift today. It starts with submission. It doesn't start with a song.
throwing some theological stuff out there. Hey, if you knew who I was, then what? Then you'd be asking me for some living water. You would never have to thirst again. And she was like, shoot, if you got show me how to get this, so I ain't got to come back. She missed the whole thing. She was all in the, in the flesh, right? She trying to figure out how she don't have to come back and get no water no more. She was like, Jesus, tell me how I can get this everlasting water. What's the truth aspect? 
I got three things about, about, about truth. True heart. True heart. Your heart has to be pure. Your heart has to be pure. Your motive has to be pure. This is part of our shift as well. Why are you shifting? Why are you worshiping? That's part of the shift. Are you worshiping just so you can get something out of it? Are you worshiping only so that you can be relieved, relieved from your burdens in life? Are you worshiping only so that you can get this good feeling where you can say, woohoo, but I ain't never felt like this before. Oh my God. Am I saying anything wrong with that? No. But is that the only reason why you want that 30 minutes on Sunday morning? Come on. So that you can get a feeling? That's not true. And I, I remember uh, when we used to do tracks, the, the worship, what, was the worship a little different when we used to have tracks? Yes. Huh? Why? <laughs> because we didn't understand the worship. <laughs> Our heart wasn't, we didn't understand it. No, I don't fault us for not, for not understanding. Why? Because America has taught us that our, our feeling right. controls yes. our worship experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Then all of a sudden we got music and we got the keyboard and two keyboards and the guitar and all this and now all of a sudden worship is good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make you want to run and all that stuff. But God is like, I need you to shift from that. Yeah. I need you to shift from that. Why? One of the things that he told her, and I really should have put this under, under, under spirit, because he said, God is a spirit. Yes. And one of, when he said that, what he was dispelling, so you can really kind of put this note under the one before, uh, what he was dispelling, the fact that she said, we worship over here, but y'all don't worship over here, so who's right? right? But God, that's why Jesus said, God is a spirit, which means what? God is not tied down to a specific location. Right. He's not tied down to a specific location. Why? He's omnipresent. Yes, He's everywhere. Amen. You can worship God There was never music present. Come on, come on. Amen. Truth, <laughs> spirit, and truth. Somebody shout, spirit and truth. Spirit, spirit and truth. Oh my God, I'm finna shift. We finna shift the way we worship. We finna shift the way we worship. That means that when the keyboard don't show up and the drummer don't show up, we still gonna run around the church. That means we gotta go back to track. We still gonna hear. We gotta go out the pedal. Why? Because it's in spirit. Yes, that's good. God is everywhere. Thank you, Father. Rashad, you can worship God at home. Yes, sir. Some of my most memorable worship experiences have been in cars. Yes. <laughs> Amen. At Amen. lunch. <laughs> On the way to work. About to wreck out. <laughs> yeah. and you talk, I come here, we'll talk, we're going to talk about corporate worship, but that's not very limited. Why? Because God is a spirit. Yes, and we worship in the spirit. It's not just tied to this building. X said that God is, he does not abide or live in a temple or house made with hands. Now he visits, <laughs> but he don't live here. He don't live in this warehouse. He just come and visit us. When we lift our hands in the sanctuary, when we enter into his gate, Yeah. 
true heart. So when not only worshiping centered in truth, not only means true heart, but it means according to the truth. Yes. Okay. There is a way to worship God. And it's in the Bible. And we'll talk about that. But <coughs> true worship is in according to the Bible, according to the truth. We got some foolish stuff going on today. We got people worshiping with snakes. Ah. And all that kind of stuff. You ain't never seen that? All you gotta do is go on. You go to YouTube. People worshiping with snakes, people <coughs> drinking poison, and, and I'm filled with the Holy Ghost and doing what Paul did and getting bit by a poisonous snake and saying, God, God is gonna do it. And that's, that's part of worship. No. But you know what? It's sincere, but it ain't true. <laughs> it's false, it's ignorant, and it's not biblical. Ah, yes. So the way we worship has to be biblical. Yes. That's why you're gonna be here for the next few weeks so we can find out what the Bible says about it. So we not only have to have a true heart, it not only has to be according to the truth. Praise team, come up, get ready. It not only has to be according to the truth, but it has to be directed to the truth. What does that mean? What did Jesus say that he was in John? I believe it's chapter 14. He says that I am the what? Bible scholars. I am the way, the what? The truth and the life. So we can't disconnect Jesus from that verse in John 4. Why? Because he says we worship in the spirit and in truth. And they come back a couple chapters later and says, I am truth. All worship has to be centered in Jesus Christ. Again, it's tied back to, it's not about me. It's about Christ. It has to be to Jesus Christ. There's no way to get to the Father but who? But what? But through Jesus Christ. Yes. That's our true worship. So, what is our big idea for this month, y'all? Those who run down. What is it? Shift from sin worship as a what? As a weekend experience to what? To a daily lifestyle of worship. What did I say our definition for worship was? Our response to what? Our response of a born again believer to what? To the work of an awesome God. So we're going to finish this worship set that they started on today. Phoenix, cut our lights off. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Lights down in that worship room. And, and we're going to wrestle. Remember, this, this, you can't just shift overnight. So this is about to be a wrestling match between what God desires us via worship and what we've always had our minds set. Go ahead, come on, play, play, play. So this, this, we had a wrestling match because I'm going to be worshiping God and I'm going to tell him how great he is, how awesome he is, and I'm, and I'm going to sing to him. And, and at the same time, I'm going to be looking for a feeling and I'm going to be looking for an experience and I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm going to try to gauge how good this worship part was of this series, of, of this uh, portion of service based on how I feel when we're done. But the fight part comes in that I'm not looking for a feeling. I'm not trying to uh, uh, gauge or measure how great this worship experience is because as long as I tell God how good he is, as long as I know that I'm worshiping him in submission, that I'm a born again believer, and as long as I know that I'm doing this for him, then I know that worship was amazing. Yes. <laughs> what will happen? If next week, 50 people come with a mindset that I just want to tell God how good he is. I don't care if I feel something. I don't care if I run around the church. I don't care about all that stuff America told us what good worship was. But if I come in here and all I'm thinking about is how good he is and how I want to tell him, guess what? We'll run around like we never ran away. Yes. <laughs> we'll shout like we never shouted. Yes. We'll receive like we never received because now God is saying, they're doing this for me. Guess what? It's yours. Everything you need is yours. The peace is yours. The joy is yours. Because you're not just worshiping me because you want something, but you're worshiping me because of what I am. So guess what? Here, it's yours. It's yours. It's yours. 
Let's worship Him in this moment.